Hello, everyone, and thanks for hanging out with us for the Behind the Numbers Weekly Listen, an e-marketer podcast made possible by BTEX. This is the Friday show that reviews the most what media news stories of the week. I'm your host, Marcus Johnson. In today's show, Facebook and Ray-Bans team up on smart glasses. If I was Ray-Ban, this wouldn't really be a trend that I'd want to be on the bleeding edge of. I just think it's only a matter of time before somebody uses these glasses to do something creepy on the subway. How cognitive disruption helps marketers get noticed. So I think he just came up, frankly, with like new phrases for like long-standing existing ideas in advertising. And, you know, I think advertisers or marketers are probably already putting these, these kind of uh, techniques into practice. How do you make friends whilst working from home? I mean, nobody wants to sign up for another Zoom activity. And so it's like this weird catch-22. And I think companies are sort of stuck in that place of they need to offer it because it needs to be available. And how one person made a huge, huge difference. All right, folks, join me for this episode. We have three people. Let's meet them. We start with our principal analyst covering retail. It's Susie David Canyon. Hey, everyone. Hey, Susie. Thank you so much for hanging out. Stepped up last minute to help us with the show. So thank you so, so much. We're also joined by one of our directors of reports editing. It's Rahul Chana. Hey, guys. Hey, chap. And finally, we have one of our analysts on the retail and e-commerce team. It's Blake Drush. Hey, everybody. You know him. All right, folks. So we've got four segments for you as per usual we start with the story of the week we're talking about ray-bans and facebook teaming up on some fancy glasses we then move to the game of the week where our contestants blake rahul and Susie, will go head to head to head to try to give us the best takeaways they can from each of the four stories we have we move to the next segment which is working from somewhere we talk about uh, what it's like to work from somewhere now that a lot of people aren't in the office and finally we move to our fourth segment the final segment dinner party data we talk about things we've just recently learned ready go story of the week is where we begin Facebook and Ray-Bans team up on smart glasses. So they've teamed up to produce a brand new $300 pair of smart glasses Facebook and Ray-Bans have. They're called Ray-Ban Stories. Think Snapchat spectacles. These glasses come in sunglass form or with clear lenses. Tap the side and a five megapixel camera records whatever you're looking at. The tiniest light you've ever seen comes on and that's supposed to signal to others that you're recording. Video recording cuts off after 30 seconds because they're designed for Facebook and Instagram stories. Nothing is automatically uploaded to Facebook or Instagram or live streamed. You download the photos and videos later and post them wherever. Tapping the button records, holding the button down takes a photo or by saying, hey, Facebook, take a picture. The glasses pair with a smartphone app called Facebook View, where you can access up to 35 30 second videos that you've recorded or 500 photos. You can also use the speaker on the arm of the glasses to take calls and listen to music. There's also a power switch so you can turn off the cameras and microphones. The glasses batteries last for about six hours of intermittent use and you charge them using the included case. Uh, Facebook says that photos aren't used for personalized ads unless you share them. The glasses went on sale last Thursday, September 9th in the US, UK, Italy, Australia, Ireland and Canada. All right. Sorry, I took some explaining, but that's the glasses for you. Uh, Initial reactions, folks. I'll throw mine out there really quick. My best friend, she goes, uh, don't you have Ray-Bans when I told her about this? And my immediate reaction was, I might have to get another brand just so people don't think that my current pair of non-Facebook glasses can record them. How do you guys feel? Every time I I read something about these AR glasses, I think of that John Carpenter film, They Live, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with, but it stars Rowdy Rowdy Piper as a drifter, (laughs) a nameless drifter who uncovers a scheme by alien overlords to basically uh, subjugate the human race. But he finds a pair of Makes glasses sense. that lets lets him decipher the subliminal messages that they've hidden in the advertising. I always think of these kinds of glasses as the reverse of that, I guess. I mean, I think the obvious issue that you know uh, comes attending with any of these kinds of devices are the privacy issues, like you mentioned, Marcus, like the light that indicates that it's recording is really small. Are people going to be aware? You know, there was a lot of pushback when Google Glass launched their smart glasses and the ability for people to record out in the wild. And I think, you know, and one of the links you sent, Marcus, the BBC reporter talked to Andrew Bosworth, who I think is the head of privacy at, at Facebook. And 
they're he basically made it to this uh, strategy, which is like, yeah, we're conditioning people to get used to these AR devices. <laughs> like it's the functionality is not quite, I think, there yet where Facebook can monetize. But really, this is like a stepping stone down that path. Yes. Uh, you know, I think the form factor, if you look from Google Glass to Snapchat spectacles, like the lenses have gotten smaller, they've gotten less bulky. So I think you're seeing an evolution in the form factor of these smart glasses. And then the other thing that it made me think about was, you know, in a recently published 5G report, it's interesting to think about that new technology is going to really increase upload, download speeds, data latency, and make it a lot easier for the computing necessary for um, this, these kinds of smart glasses to ch- achieve some kind of like real function in the, in the real world mm. to be shifted to the cloud instead of on the device, which again is just going to make the devices smaller and, and really push us faster towards this, this, like as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, this metaverse that I think Mark Zuckerberg envisions for us all. So let's start with what you said about privacy. So Wall Street Journal's Joanna Stone did a really good video on this. And she referred to them as spy glasses. And it got me thinking, if you were to design a pair of spy glasses and try to make sure that people who you were spying on didn't know that you were recording them, you would probably design this very pair of glasses. She did a hidden camera experiment with about 20 people in public using the glasses and not single person spotted the cameras or the recording light until she told them. Blake, Susie, did you agree or do you think that it was uh, the light was obvious enough? I have so much to say about this, but it was <laughs> not about the light. I think that if they were meant to be spy glasses, it wouldn't be 30 second videos. Like what can you possibly spy on? Imagine you're going to just keep hitting the light if you're actually trying to get video that you can use in court mm. or somewhere else. So I don't know that that was the intention. I'm sure it'll be longer than 30 seconds at some point. I yeah. kept thinking about this is like the 2.0, but I guess I didn't know about the Snapchat glasses. So it's like the 3.0 version. The Google ones, when I did a quick search, they were $1,500. Maybe that was how much they were originally. So I feel like this is, Facebook knows what they're doing. It's $300. It's expensive, but it's not that expensive. Ray-Ban is a cool brand. So it kind of gives the Facebook glasses a bit of a better vibe versus the Google glasses that were just Google yeah. branded. I think that everybody's creeped out about data, but at the same time, if you can use the data to make it more convenient, and we talk about this all the time in the retail world, right? If you can use the data to make it more convenient for the consumer, then they are more apt to do it for you. And this is like a multifunctional pair of glasses. You can do pictures, you can do videos, you send it right up to the social media app. Like it's kind of cool. I wouldn't get it, but it's kind of (laughs) cool. So the two points you raised, one price. So the Vision Council says that over half of the glasses worn by folks in America, they reported paying between $100 to $150 for frames. So this is definitely a lot closer to that. It is Ray-Ban, so it's going to command a higher price. Price and it is they are smart glasses, so you could argue they're gonna they're worth you know paying two or three times more than what you'd normally pay. And this next point touches on Rahul, what you said in terms of AR and augmented reality, but also Susie, what you said in terms of convenience, because these don't really have any, if don't have much, if any, uh, augmented reality functionality, but they are coming. Uh, and as Rahul said, Andrew Bosworth is saying, like that's what's next is we're going to getting people used to those glasses. And at the minute, I don't think there's enough functionality for, to convince folks to look past the creepy element. But if you start thinking about navigation tools, arrows in front of your face to show you which way to go, as opposed to you pulling out your phone, uh, having messages read to you, answering calls on the go, checking banking information without pulling out your phone. Uh, If you think, to Susie's point, if you make things more convenient, then the behavior more likely to be sticky. So the only thing I would, in addition to all that, I would say is that people, again, it's similar to retail. There were a lot of technologies. The Google Glasses, when I checked, they're from like 10-ish years ago. So People don't always come up with and are ready to use new technology, but once it starts to get a little bit more in the masses, if you will, and this is where the Ray-Ban part comes in, then I think consumers are willing to adapt things a little bit more quickly. And because of last year, I think this was a really good time for Facebook to launch because everybody is just a little bit more open to frictionful experiences. Yeah. I'm curious to know whether this does Ray-Bans any lasting brand damage being associated with Facebook and the idea that any pair of Ray-Bans now, if once people get kind of catch word of this, once they figure out that this is a thing, they'll be concerned that if they have Ray-Bans, people might, like I was saying at the top, like might think that they're also, they also feature cameras in them. I do think this is an interesting concept because the first person view is an interesting view. But I was thinking more if you can account for, you know, the the fact that people don't know you're going to be recording them. If these glasses were 
say like bright pink and you could record part of your hike up a beautiful mountain and then send that to your family and friends i think you know that first person view is quite attractive you know freedom access was saying that you can take a picture or video now without having to watch the moment through your phone so as the person recording the moment as well you no longer have to hold your phone up and watch the entire concert through your phone or even 30 seconds through your phone you can actually just watch what's going on and have it be recorded yeah, I don't know. I, if I was Ray-Ban, this wouldn't really be a trend that I'd want to be on the bleeding edge of. I just <laughs> think it's only a matter of time before somebody uses these glasses to do something creepy on the subway and it's just be, going to become an issue for them. And then it's it's like, Marcus, you bring up a good point. Nobody wants glasses that can conceal a recording because it's creepy and nobody wants to wear glasses that have an obvious camera because it looks weird. So you're kind of like in between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. And thirdly, don't show me a video of your hike. I have no interest in watching that. <laughs> I will not watch it. Are you sure? I'm positive. I took one. I was going to send it later. All right, fine. I'll delete it. I was actually struck too by this idea that there is a point of friction between like the recording of the material and then like sharing it on, on social media. I thought that was like kind of an interesting and somewhat confusing move to me by Facebook because... Really, what we're talking about right now is a GoPro in a different form factor. Mm. Yeah, it's like less, mm -hmm. you know, kind of obvious, but really it just does the same thing that a GoPro does. You have to take this device back to your computer, like you mentioned, Marcus, and download the photos and then up re upload them like via a social media platform. So, yeah, the I guess it just has to do with like the coolness factor, like Susie was talking about. Is that the thing that's going to attract people? And unfortunately, I do think, unlike what Blake was saying, that this is just going to attract the creepy people, you know, like. There are mm -hmm. people who are just, I think the internet is rife with creepy videos, unfortunately. And like, I'm not sure that's the demographic that yeah. Facebook or Ray-Bans really wants to appeal to. Well, to your GoPro point, that you can take a better picture with your phone. And it was saying you can take, like, listen to better audio quality with headphones. So it's not like you're getting a camera quality of your smartphone or the audio quality of your headphones with this. So you're going to have to take a hit there if you're willing to. In terms of the cool and creepy, Miss Stern of the Wall Street Journal was saying, whenever I think of cool, I can't shake the creepy. It's easy to record your kids, your own kids. That's fantastic. But it's just as easy for a stranger to record your kids, you know, without having the motion of holding up their phone so you can see that they maybe are recording your children. Or it's easy to capture a moment with friends it's just as easy for someone to record a partner who's unaware that the camera's on so it's gonna be difficult to get to get away from that it's also very easy to cover Ms. Stern was saying to cover the light with a piece of black tape so you could cover the light entirely and the thing still works I missed the boat on the friction filled Rahul's point but I I'm just gonna insert it now which is I think they did it on purpose I think they wanted it not to be so easy to upload right away so that it tries to minimize the creep factor mm. and that in the like next version it'll be automatic mm. but that takes a lot of faith in the process and that people are not misusing the glasses and so I think they probably needed to figure that out first yeah yeah I think I agree with you but I think that part the strategy on Facebook's part is confusing to me because then I think it limits the appeal you know I understand the appeal of a you know, first wave technology adopter who's like lives and dies on Instagram and just they're like, oh, this solves a problem for me. But that person is probably that not gonna, you. That is not <laughs> me. <you know? laughs> I will offer a 10,000 bounty to anybody who can find my Instagram profile because I don't have one. But, um, you know, I think really that's the part that to me is uh, this first wave, which is kind of a, like, you know, the like guy said is designed to like condition people to adopt this technology. But it still the way they design it is just kind of limits i think the appeal to a wide variety of people honestly mm -hmm. um so yeah. you know i think like he mentioned it's like a stepping stone but you know i guess we'll just have to wait and see what the next device that they come out with is our former colleague uh, nicole perrin who used to host the ad platform uh, principal analyst she had always mentioned whenever we brought up smart glasses she would always say that a lot of people wear prescription glasses uh 164 million americans in fact wear eyeglasses according to the vision council that's basically half the entire population of of the US. However, in a freed of Axios was noting that in addition to coming in several styles and colors, they can be made as sunglasses or untinted lenses, prescription, and even progressive lenses. So it seems like they might have solved for that. Anyway, that's what we've got time for for the story of the week. It's time now for the game of the week. First quick word from our sponsor, Vtex.
Everyone is talking about digital transformation, but what does it mean in real life? Digital Insider is a new podcast series about the digitalization of retail, where business leaders, academics, and thinkers discuss how businesses are transforming and give their perspectives, practical advice, thought process, and lessons learned. Go to digitalinsider.com to learn more or listen to it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Folks, we're back. It's time now for the game of the week. Today's game, what is the point? The part of the show where we read out four stories and have our contestants, Rahul, Blake and Susie, tell us what they think is the main takeaway of the story. Okay, answers get one point. Good answers get you two points and magical ones will get you three points. Each person gets 20 seconds to answer before they hear this noise. Whoever has the most points after four rounds wins and gets the last word. We start with Rahul, top of the screen. Did time spent on TikTok just surpass YouTube. App Annu data reported on by The Verge suggests that time spent on the TikTok app first surpassed YouTube on Android devices, to be specific, in August 2020 and remained higher for eight of the next 10 months. So a sustained trend, according to them, US users watched 24 hours of TikTok content each month. YouTube users watched an hour and 20 minutes less. So 22 40, 22 hours and 40 minutes. Rahul, did time spent on TikTok just surpass YouTube? What's the point? I, maybe I misread the data, but the way I understood it was that the key details and maybe the caveats were that this was data among TikTok users specifically and TikTok users on Android. So what it was saying that TikTok users are spending more time on TikTok than they are on YouTube. Mm. So if I'm understanding that correctly, I think it's just a testament to the idea that TikTok users love TikTok. They just keep spending a lot of time on it. You know, it reinforces the stickiness of the app. And, you know, it's a testament to the power of TikTok's vaunted uh, algorithm, which is really no small feat in the attention economy, I think. Blake. Yeah, I think, you know, as TikTok expands as a platform, and especially as there are now rumors going around that it's going to increase the maximum video length to five minutes, it will be come more of a direct competitor with YouTube. But I agree with Rahul and additionally that I think that TikTok has a comparatively smaller demographically but much more dedicated user base than YouTube does, which uh, attracts a much more general audience for a variety of reasons. So while they might you know, start resembling each other, I think there's still a large distinction there, at least for now. Susie. So I think the only other thing I would add is I, because I agree with what everybody said, I couldn't wrap my head around 25 plus ish hours a month on any one of these platforms. And then I thought of myself and I'm like, just one more, one more time. Right. And so if TikTok is three to five minutes, let's say it's so much easier to be like, okay, just one more video, just one more of this versus the article was saying on average that competes with a 10 minute YouTube video. And slotting in an extra 10 minutes when you're in a rush to do something else just seems a little bit harder. So I think there is magic in the short video form. Uh, so I looked at our numbers for this. So across all devices, we have YouTube users watching 44 minutes a day of YouTube. We have TikTok users watching seven minutes less of TikTok. So YouTube users 44 minutes on YouTube, TikTok users 37 minutes on TikTok. The story we were saying was just on Android devices. That was across both the data I just gave you from us. We move to our second round. We start with Blake. Branded gaming on Roblox. Hyundai and Vans are both creating their own in-game worlds on popular video game Roblox. It's kind of like if you smash Minecraft and Lego together, you get this Roblox game. Our insider intelligence analyst Nina Getson explains the two worlds that they are creating. The new Hyundai Mobility Adventure aims to get a younger audience familiar with driving by letting players take cars on virtual test drives. Meanwhile, she says, Vans World lets fans deck out their avatar in Vans gear and skateboard around a Vans-themed park. Blake, branded gaming on Roblox, what's the point? Yeah, I think that a lot of these sort of virtual experiential marketing and sponsorships really had like a lot of attention on it in the pandemic as sort of one of those trends that was like hyper accelerated. But I think looking back on it now, it's still a little bit too early for these types of experiences to really gain a widespread appeal. But I think it will be something that we're maybe going to see downtrend a little bit for now. But certainly, 
there are a lot of prospects for it being applicable to things not only within video games, but with the larger virtual world, you know, down the line. Our residence Roblox gamer, Susie. So I agree, this is relatively nascent. Everybody is talking about metaverse, but they're still experimenting. I think it's important for brands to make sure that they stay true to who their target market is. But I do find that Roblox is addictive. You, I talked about this last week with my little nephew who's like on it nonstop and we play together and it's hard. So you're glued uh-huh. to it. So it's addictive. It has, you have to pay attention. And so that makes it really good exposure for some of these brands. So I think for the brands who choose wisely their experience, it's a win. Has your nephew asked you to play again since, Susie? I haven't seen him, but you're right. I should call because we don't even have to be in the same house. I can play from here. That means no. He's not interested. (laughs) He was frustrated. (laughs) Rahul? Yeah, I mean, uh, like Instagram, I'm I'm not on Roblox and I'm not going to pretend what? to understand exactly how it works. No way. But, you know, it's just the continuation of this trend is this is where kids obviously are spending a lot of time. Um, the thing that was a little confusing to me was my understanding is that really it appeals widely to kids under 13. So Honda is maybe trying to grow that that like younger base into a potential consumer uh, subset for themselves. But I think the the challenge that places like Roblox face is really just that right now it seems like their uh, user base is limited to a a younger demographic and maybe they're trying to grow up with with that user base, I guess. Move to our third round. Cognitive disruption helps marketers cut through the clutter. Hyundai Intermark Group's Jake McKenzie wrote a piece in Adweek explaining four psychological concepts for breaking the mold with creative campaigns. He notes that people see thousands of ads each day, but the amount of time we spend attending to those ads, really paying attention to them, is really small. Estimates suggest that less than 43% of TV ads are viewed, and when they are, they're typically attended for less than 14 seconds for social media and banner ads these numbers are even lower he says it's not surprising that we have a difficult time noticing ads since we're constantly processing a lot of information so how do you get consumers attention well four things he points to one cognitive disruption that's when something unexpected happens and it engages the brain it's why the cadbury's ad with the gorilla did so well he says number two matching mood you're more likely to notice an ad for a chevrolet whilst watching a nascar race Number three, personalization. Insurance company Aflac casting renowned Alabama college football coach Nick Saban in its recent ad campaigns seems like an odd choice, but he is immediately identifiable for college football fans, so they pay attention to the ads content because Saban is the spokesman. And number four, anthropomorphism is when recurring characters are used uh, because people are familiar with them after a while, like progressive character flow. So Susie, cognitive disruption, helping marketers get noticed. What's the point? The point is that there are too many commercials. People don't watch them. People spend 14 seconds on average and they're probably multitasking. And I always thought if you had some sort of emotional connection and or comedy, that that would be the best way to get cut through the clutter. But that was not one of the four things that the writer spoke about. And so then I would just say, be authentic, be true to your brand and make sure that you stand out, that people can identify whatever narrative you're trying to say in your commercial to who your brand is. Raul. I'm not sure this guy raised any like concepts that are new to advertising, to be perfectly frank. You know, this idea of cognitive disruption, I think, faces a challenge in the sense that it requires a lot of alignment and creative. You have to get buy-in if you're going to, you know, show a commercial of a gorilla drumming to a Phil Collins song and the ads for Cadbury. And it raises questions, frankly, to my mind about ad recall. Sometimes I remember ads and I have no idea what the advertisement's actually mm. for. You know, this idea of matching mood sounds a lot like contextual advertising. (laughs) Personalization is basically targeting and anthropomorphism is essentially celebrity endorsement. So I think he just came up, frankly, with like new phrases for like longstanding existing ideas in advertising. And, you know, I think advertisers or marketers are probably already putting these these kind of uh, techniques into practice. Like... Yeah, I, gonna, I don't know if these like these like pseudo psychoanalytic theories would apply to marketing are really like all that necessary or relevant today when a lot of the you know sort of the assessment of consumer behavior and sort of at psychology was really popular in sort of the you know the olden days of advertising i think now just like a sort of a good old fashioned you know personalized instagram ad is going to be way more effective than uh, trying to, you know, play out some sort of, you know, weird psychoanalytic theory to try to like capture 
some you know repressed piece of a consumer's brain. I don't know. It just it's it's. I agree with Rahul where it's kind of like applying fancy words to basically common practice. <laughs> Moves our fourth round. Selling Super Bowl ads early. It took CBS right up until a few weeks before Super Bowl 55 back in February of this year before they sold out of ad space. For the upcoming Super Bowl 56, NBC Universal has reportedly sold 85% of ad space already, securing up to $6 million for a 30-second slot. That's 9% more than it charged last year. But Fox Sports is already about to start selling inventory for 2023's Super Bowl 57. Not this coming one, the following one. No, it's ad week. Yep a whole year and a half before the game. So Rahul, selling Super Bowl ads early, what's the point? Uh, For me, this is just basically this ad seller just trying to lock in revenue as early as they can. You know, there are very few live events left in the US to deliver the kind of scale that the Super Bowl does. Why not like trap that revenue as early as you can? There's so many X factors still going on, you know. Uh, the Super Bowl, I think, ratings hit a 15-year low in this year, according to the New York Times article I found. And so I think we're going to see the continuation of that decline in ratings. The pandemic, it remains like a questionable thing that might affect uh, live events in the future. So yeah, let me get in this revenue. And then if something happens to upset the Apple cart, you know, I can just offer it. My ad buyers make goods further down the road. Yep. Yeah, easier to lock in ad revenue whilst the audience is going down uh, as opposed to no one's trying to lock that in as audiences are growing. Blake? Yeah, I think it's just, you know, there aren't uh, many events these days that are sort of Super Bowl caliber. So it just makes those media buys so much more valuable that they can sell them out much further in advance than they, you know, have traditionally been able to do. Susie? The only thing I would add is what budget year does that go into? Like if you're buying it 18 mm. months out, how are they budgeting for that? I just don't understand. Petty cash is where that comes from. And like, yeah, wouldn't you want to know who the Super Bowl halftime singer is before you decide? Like, what if it's someone that's super not for your brand, you know, and you don't stand behind? I, I don't know. I find it fascinating. Yeah. How far in advance do they announce that? I am not a football Sometimes person. they'll have like the hosts of the of like award shows, you'll kind of know who it is, but that, that far in advance, maybe not. It's a good point. I think it's like midway through the season, maybe, that they'll announce mm. who the halftime mm. performer is. Oh, uh, it's where it's going to be. Where it's going to be is years out, yeah. yeah I wonder okay. if this is, because not watching football at all, I got the impression from the article that they're switching from one broadcast network to another, right? And so is it, right, is it going from NBC to Fox or am I making that up? Yeah, but I think there is like a set rotation between oh. NBC, Fox, and CBS, and it's that's it's another thing that's like years out down the line where it's it's like all determined, but it is some sort of like it's a rotation. Oh, okay. Maybe even ABC too. I'm not sure, but at least those oh. three. Okay, then mm-hmm. that makes sense because I thought maybe that had an impact that they were trying to like one up each other, but mm. not if it's a natu- if it happens frequently, then then that yeah. wouldn't be it. One more point from our insider intelligence analyst, Nina Getson. She notes that Fox Sports' decision to sell inventory more than a year in advance runs counter to the flexibility that many advertisers have been preaching during the pandemic. All right, that's all we've got time for for the game of the week. This week's winner a drum, is, Ra- Ra- is Rahul. Rahul won. There's no point of the drum roll. Rahul won again. <laughs> oh, thank you. Congratulations. You're going to just make us all, you're going to make us turn against poor Rahul with just <laughs> your, your. That's my hope. <laughs> I would like to understand how we make decisions. I would like to understand how I can win next time on my own. Fair versus last time. It's really easy. You gotta you gotta grease Marcus's palm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's no secret. Yeah. Apparently I greased accidentally poor Peter's last time because he let me talk about my nephew. Yeah. He goes There Susan used to be a, there suggestion. was a time on this podcast where like after each round, each story Marcus would be like, oh, so-and-so gets one point, so-and-so gets two points. And like even that was like kind of arbitrary and just like going <laughs> off the whim on whatever Marcus wanted to do. But it's just as time has gotten on, it's just gotten less and less legitimate uh, <laughs> in terms of like even like pretending that there's an actual scoring system in place and not just Marcus just picking favorites. Well, are you going to accept that? 
Yeah, unfortunately, I'll take whatever win I can get. It's, <laughs> it's spot. It's Blake's spot on. That's exactly what happened. I I did used to do that. I'd forgotten that I actually used to pretend to care more. I used to actually <laughs> give people points that I made up that meant nothing. Yeah, I believe and there's then, a piece of paper and a pencil involved as well too. Like it was, I did used to there was pretend a, there was to a record down, of it, yeah. but now it's just yeah. yeah there's just no I used to just I used to goes. just write down not Blake. Just make sure. Not <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I remember seeing that one time on when we were back when we used yeah. to podcast in the studio. I was like, "Why is my name on this piece Anyone of paper? And why is there an X him. through it?" <laughs> I'd also like to see the arithmetic to see if you're awarding people negative points for bad answers. Yeah, yeah, Susie. This is what because well, I just, talked too fast. Just say <laughs> yeah, negative one for Susie. That's how game is played, and that's how it scored. It's completely made up. Uh, Rahul, you won. You get some airtime. Do you want your 30 seconds to say something? Oh, yeah. Then I would definitely plug John Carpenter's films. <laughs> I gave him a shout out, I think, one of my earlier answers. You know, great social commentary, a lot of allegory embedded in his work. And he was a composer, too. And he's actually responsible for a lot of like horror film firsts that turned into tropes or cliches, essentially, but he was really the progenitor and the vanguard of those ideas. So yeah, check out his catalog. Great stuff. I'm surprised you didn't plug the Amazon report. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is plugging. This is, let's do it. It's, it's a, this is big news. Let's, what we got for it? What we got for the listeners? I will never not plug a report in an appropriate way. I'm very excited. It finally published. It is a very large handful of analysts from across the different desks and verticals. So it's the first time that we've gotten such a comprehensive deep dive into one single retailer slash big tech slash multi-type business firm. And we look at both where they sit today, the company and the different divisions, and also each analyst who is an expert in that particular space talks through where they see Amazon's five-year outlook being. And I think it's a very powerful piece of work. And I'm very excited that it's uh, published. Uh, the Power of Amazon Correct. is the title. How 19 business divisions fuel Amazon's flywheel written by uh, everyone. Yep. There's so many people involved. Uh, Susie's one, Blake is one who are on this. And Rahul uh, is one, I mean, in terms of contributor. Where's your name, Rahul? It's, on the, it's in a different part of the report. Oh, okay. Rahul as well. Everyone's one. There's so many people here. So check that out. If you're a pro subscriber, you can get that at .com. Um If you're not, you can't get it. Okay. That's just how it goes. But if you subscribe to the free newsletter, you will get a tiny little excerpt. Oh, okay. You get a can taste. also do that. Yes. Just a taste. Just a, a tiny You're little, want more. little piece. Just subscribe. Yes. You're just want subscribe. More. All right. That's what we've got time for for the game of the week. Time now for Working From Somewhere. So the part of the show where we talk about working from somewhere, what it's like to work from somewhere that's maybe the office again, but maybe it's still at home or wherever you're working. So today we have a couple of articles that we reviewed for this, but really talking about one main theme, which is uh, friends and uh, colleagues and those relationships that you used to make in the office and how to recreate those connections uh, virtually or maybe how to recreate them in person now that we're living during a pandemic. And so a surge in COVID-19 cases due to the Delta variant has caused many companies to rethink their plans to bring employees back to the office, writes Lauren Hirsch and Kellen Browning of the New York Times. Apple, who was among the first US companies to have workers stay at home when the pandemic started, they've postponed their return to the office from October of this year to January 2022. Amazon, Facebook, Uber, Google, Starbucks are just some of the other companies who have done the same. A May to August Gallup study suggests that among white collar workers, two thirds are still working from home at least part of the time. So where do we stand uh, with the coronavirus in the US? A couple of figures for you. Uh, half the country fully vaccinated. Over 60% have had at least one dose. Vaccines still unavailable for children under 12. A lot of those kids headed back to school in person or have already headed back to school in person this fall. In terms of COVID cases, they are 10 times higher than they were at the start of July, now averaging about 150,000 new cases a day, around 100,000 folks in hospital because of COVID and around 1,600 Americans still losing their lives to the pandemic every single day. That was according to the latest seven-day average. Uh, so that's the state of affairs and one reason that, that a lot of companies have been hesitant to rush back to the office or even to crawl back to the office. 
So yeah, folks, not everyone seems to be waiting until 2022. Financial institutions uh, have been much more aggressive. A lot of banks are more aggressive at getting their employees back into the office. Spotify said they're officially a work from anywhere company and Microsoft, they delayed their return to the office indefinitely. So uh, if we're going to you know, be doing this remote thing for a while longer, how do you make friends whilst working from home? Asks uh, Krithika Varaga at the Wall Street Journal. Zoom calls, but also regular in-person meetups at safe outdoor venues. The article suggests bringing family and significant others as well to those meetups can help keep the conversation away from work. So folks, you read the article for this. What, what did you think of this idea of trying to connect with colleagues that you haven't seen in a while or perhaps have never met and, and try and make some friends? Yeah, I think that uh, people are just going to learn how to how to socialize on their own, you know, with people that they work with, but having to maybe just learn to take that extra step to initiate an in-person meetup uh, if the company that you work for isn't going to set it up. Where it gets a little iffy, though, is that as more and more companies adopt work anywhere policies, then you're going to start to have companies that are much more geographically diverse than maybe traditionally. And if you do not live in the same area as many of your colleagues, then it's going to become a lot more different uh, when it comes to in-person. It's a good point. But I think that um, the concern here, so Dr. Jennifer Deal, uh, senior research scientist at USC's Marshall School of Business, in the article, she was saying that she worries that not everyone is as forceful, self-assured, or extroverted, maybe just confident to say, I'm going to a new job, or maybe I'm in an existing job, and I'm going to set up coffee chat. So it seems as though the company might have to force the issue a little bit for the sake of the company culture and those relationships, perhaps. Well, we'll see. I'm not someone who, you know, is I'd rush into a company and make try and make as many friends as possible because I'm a bit more reserved, a bit more shy. But knowing that this is going to be the state of affairs for a long period of time, I would force myself to try and do that because I think it is really important. It's also really important because Kellen Browning and Erin Griffith at the Times were saying, if you haven't met any of your or many or any of your colleagues in person, it might make it easier to quit when a new job comes along and vice versa you being let go. And so how much would you miss about your colleagues if you knew nothing about them? So over time, maybe it might just be easier for people to move about between jobs, which maybe isn't a great thing. Yeah, I was struck by the participants in these like extracurricular meetups, sort of, they were all under 30, I think, without exception, except maybe one pair of people who sort of met via Zoom call and developed a relationship. It was, and it seemed that seemed more out of serendipity. So I think really a more fundamental question is about, for me, is about how are companies kind of reacting to this ongoing issue of distributed workforces and like, how are we going to build a company culture around that? Yeah. Uh, because I think, like you said, Marcus, it's like a lot of people, I think the expert they interviewed in the article said are unlikely to you know, take on that responsibility. And I think younger people who are new to the workforce might not understand that that is, you know, it's within their capability that they have the yeah. agency to do that. They, or all that important, perhaps. Or, yeah, understand the benefits of it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think it is something that is seems like maybe falling disproportionately on the shoulders of workers and uh, companies still need to figure out, like, how are we going to create a company culture in, you know, a remote workforce environment? I think this is a hard one, though, because if we were mandated to do happy hours, at what point would we all be like, okay, I don't want to go on another happy hour and I'm zoomed <laughs> out? You know, I think it's just so hard. It's a catch-22. It's a little bit mm-hmm. like... I happen to be the president of my university's club here in New York. And on the one hand, we get complaints around how we don't do enough events. But when we do them, I mean, nobody wants to sign up for another Zoom activity. And so it's like this weird catch-22. And I think companies are sort of stuck in that place of they need to offer it because it needs to be available. But then they have to figure out better ways right. of helping make these connections. So whether it's a networking program or whether it's like, we did uh, speed networking at the company I worked for before, which was kind of cool. It wasn't virtual, but I think that's something we could probably do. Yeah. There are lots of things. Yeah. That's a really good idea, but I think it has to be offered. Yes. If if people don't want to go, that's one thing, but you've got to offer it number one. 
And number two, why can't you start making it in person? And if people don't want to go, that's fine. You can still do socially distanced things as well. You could have a pickup, you know, softball game or game of Frisbee or just something where people have the opportunity to go out or even just encouraging colleagues, you know, saying that, you know, once a a month, once every two weeks, you can expense, uh, you know, a coffee, you know, like $20 worth of like, coffee and donuts to go meet up with a colleague somewhere if you have colleagues who live perhaps in the area or you know maybe some colleagues are willing to to you know share roughly which area they live live in and maybe there are other colleagues who live near them who they didn't even know lived in the in the area they can meet up with or, or whatever marcus i think you've been here too long if you're referring to coffee and donuts and not scones maybe oh it's because i know how to speak american now I see. otherwise people look at me like i'm a maniac i see Number of times I have to say the red ones when I want tomatoes. <laughs> so annoying. People have no idea what I'm talking about. Can I just say one more thing about the the social activity? It is definitely in companies' interest because just like how we have NPS scores for retailers and consumers, their experience with retailers, HR companies keep track of how satisfied our employees. And one of the questions that is mm. often asked is, do you feel like you have a best friend or do you feel like you have a friend? A confidant, it, and it was one of the words in the in the article at the company. And there is research that shows that if you feel a sense of connectivity, which is translated by friends in this instance, that you are happier. And of course, we know that happier employees typically produce better. Yeah, produce more, stay longer. Some of the parts of the article, Susie, you're talking about, yeah, making friends, they said at work, is getting harder. Even before the pandemic in 1985, 27% of Americans had at least one confidant at work. 20 years later, 2004, it had gone from 27 to 16%, according to the survey by the independent research organization uh, NORC, N-O-R-C, at the University of Chicago. 2017 study, over half of folks had less than six, five or fewer friends at work, uh, according to a survey of 2,000 managers and employees in 10 countries by wellness tech firm Virgin Pulse and HR advisory company Future Workplace. A few more points here before we move on. Um, It's also more difficult to gauge tone of emails from people you've never met before. I'm fortunate in that I get to kind of see everybody or see a lot of people that I talk to through the show, whether we're you know thinking about what content to, to come up with, scheduling things, or just recording the podcast. Uh, so I do get to meet a lot of new people that way, but not everybody has that opportunity. Some people you'll interact with a ton before you actually see them, hear their voice, see how you know, how they behave. And then finally, Mr. Browning and Ms. Griffith of the New York Times were noting to help prevent more folks from leaving their company, from leaving their jobs, peop- uh, because they're not, they've not formed bonds, in-person bonds. Some employers like Facebook are reconfiguring their corporate cultures and spinning up new positions, they say, like head of remote to help employees work well together, feel motivated and help the company adjust to a mostly remote workforce. Right, folks, that's what we've got time for, for working from somewhere. If you want to email us with any thoughts, feelings, podcast at is where you can get in touch. It's time now for Dinner Party Data. The part of the show where we tell you the most interesting thing that we've recently learned. We start with Rahul because he won the game of the week again. Yeah, so mine, get ready for some full-fledged nerdery here. Uh, I read this interesting article in the Vox about how it's so much more comparatively expensive to build infrastructure in the U.S. than in other countries. And this article cited the fact that the Second Avenue subway cost about $2.6 billion per mile to build, uh, while cities like Copenhagen, Paris, and Madrid did at a cost of a couple hundred thousand dollars per mile. So the article just went on to explain that there's no real good explanation for why it's so much more expensive to build infrastructure in the U.S. than it is other countries or some operating theories. My favorite of which was that we're just out of practice. Uh, They said, you know, (laughs) we built the New York City subway at a furious pace until around 1940 and then called it quits. Another was the rise of the citizen voice. So you're you're seeing uh, legislation that's supposed to give citizens protections, like in terms of uh, environmental impact of the building out of infrastructure. And what that really does is result in lawsuits that impede the construction of these things. So it drags the process on and adding up the bill of costs. But the takeaway that the authors also had, or I guess the conclusion that he he or she came to is really that the answer is not to spend less. And this was after talking to uh, experts. And it was that we need to just keep doing this and get better at it, I guess basically, you know, get that practice and also just keep tabs on the, keep closer tabs on the costs and why are they accruing and then and figure out how to do it. And, you know, this all comes on the heels of uh, 
uh, Biden's efforts to pass a uh, large, very large infrastructure bill. So I'm curious to see how that's going to play out. Mm, very good. How did you come across this article, Rahul? I don't remember. I'm sure it was in one of the newsletters I subscribed to. Maybe mm. Benedict Evans. I'm not sure. Okay. Interesting. As American people, do you do you <laughs> feel like like the infrastructure is not good? Or no, like, it is not. It's objectively not good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right, just stick it. All right. Just. <laughs> Yeah, I would say it's it's bad. <laughs> okay, all right. Because I yeah, I thought it was not great, and then I went home and was like, oh, <laughs> so it's worse here. It's not worse there actually. It's bad. It was bad in both places. It's bad everywhere. All right, very good. Uh, Susie, you're up. Great. I came t- late to the party, so I have some data which ties back to one of our stories, which is: Can you guess how many teams? It took to win 58% of the Super Bowls that have already happened. So a small number. you num- brought football I sure data. did. I want to be invited back and maybe even oh, okay. <laughs> subjectively win at one of these. Okay. It's definitely helping your case. I'm not going to lie to you. I think seven. What do you other, what do you other folks think? I would it's say hard to win it's, it's can't, yeah. it can't be that many, right? Because... Well, who the, the you've got like the Packers and the Patriots that have all and like I think the Bears have Steelers? won a bunch. The Steel, I I'm gonna say it's like probably like I'm gonna say it's like five. I'll take the I'll take under even. Okay, Rahul, what you got? Uh, yeah, I think I'll go with four, which is like underbidding. I feel like is a terrible strategy, and the price is right, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything about sports, so this is a much more fun game. Susie, why don't you bring this up earlier? We could have scrapped the game of the week and just played this. You guys, it's six teams: the Patriots and the Steelers. Ooh. Each won six. The Cowboys and the 49ers have each won five, and the Packers and the Giants have each won four. Wow, just the six. All right, Blake, close, my friend. That was good. Rahul, you were way off. <laughs> <laughs> you can add football to the column of Instagram and Roblox as well as things <laughs> I understand to eliminate. I'm going to cut in me saying six so I get it right. <laughs> Victoria, let's make that happen. Uh, who's the last to go? Blake, your turn, my friend. So this is this kind of runs along the lines of our work from anywhere policy. There is a YouGov survey sent out earlier this spring asking respondents how likely do you think it is that the first humans will land on the planet mars within your lifetime the largest percentage of people said not very likely so 27 percent but 26 percent did say fairly likely so it's actually about between like all the likelihoods it's basically split down the middle um but then the next question They asked, you know, please imagine that you had the opportunity to travel to Mars safely and become one of the first humans to live on the planet in a colony for the remainder of your life. Would you want to live on Mars in a colony? So only 25% said yes, that they would. But it's kind of interesting when you break it down by demographics. So 31% of males said they would live on Mars as opposed to 20% of women. The youngest generation that they that they broke it out into, so 18 to 34-year-olds, 45% of them said that they would live on Mars, which probably tells you a little bit about how young people are thinking about sort of what the future is in store on Earth for them. Um, and then... When it comes down to region, 28% of people living in the Midwest would live on Mars compared to 25% from the South, 24% from the Northeast, and 23% from the West. And that one kind of makes sense to me because as someone who's been to most of this country, I would say that the Midwest kind of resembles the surface of Mars (laughs) <laughs> most closely, especially when you get into like Nebraska and you're sort of like getting towards the Rocky Mountains and like things are getting a, like kind of like flat and like the ground sort of ha- you kind of have that like red earth that Isn't is that kind Arizona? of the closest thing. Maybe a when little bit said, of Arizona too, but that that when, region. Um, when but you said that region, I thought me. you meant I thought you meant what region of Mars? I thought they were like which re- would North Mars? Is that where you want to be? I'm not familiar what? with the regions of Mars, but I would I would imagine no, that's that the why climate that's is strange, pretty consistent. A strange question. Uh, well, speaking about the climate, it's uh, why do people want to go somewhere? First of all, it take, I think it takes seven months just to get there. No, thank you. Yeah, but have you seen what's been going on here lately? Yeah, that's fair. 
But then also when you get there, the average temperature is negative 81 Fahrenheit. It goes from 86 Fahrenheit to negative 300 Fahrenheit for Celsius people. That's 30 Celsius to negative 140. And I just want to point out that it might seem like Marcus is reading this, but he just knows this, and it's confusing to me as to I why. Have all this information. Yeah, that's that's it. also very odd. I didn't, I didn't even, that didn't even occur to me. But that is weird. It seems I like you've this... given more thought to this than maybe most of the people <laughs> that were surveyed. Of this. Yeah, I just thought you were a good Googler. No, I'm a genius. I think after as many uh-huh. days as Marcus has spent just waking up to just the the London or England. Just cloudy, rainy, chilly. He just decided one day to start Googling. Maybe things might be a little bit better on Mars. <laughs> ever, since we start, <laughs> ever since we started the fact of the day, I spend most of my day just researching stuff that does not matter to anyone. That's how I spend my life. Speaking of which, I've got two things for you. That was good, Blake. Very well. Very, very well played. I've got two for you real quick. Number one, the actors who play Minnie and Mickey, what? They actually fell in love and got married. Wait, Victoria, did you know that? Oh, okay. Shaking her did head, everyone, yes. Did, I had no idea. <laughs> okay. Wayne Allwine started as a male clerk in Disney Studios and worked his way up to be Mickey's voice in uh, production in 1977. In 86, nine years later, Russie Taylor joined Disney Studios as Minnie's voice. And at the time, Allwine and Taylor were both, uh, it says, unhappily married. They were both married. Um, I don't know whether it was happily or otherwise, I can't comment. But they met in passing in the halls and slowly became great friends. Eventually, they left their previous marriages to live happily ever after with each other, getting married in 1991, five years after they met. They are married in real life, it's crazy. Second one I got for you. This one's amazing. Get ready to Google something, okay? Because I've got something for you to Google so you can be extra blown away with this person's achievement. One person laid the seeds for an entire forest. So, Sebastian, I'm saying his name wrong. Let's just get that straight. Sebastio Salgado grew up in Minas Gerais in Brazil, a place full of beautiful rainforests. He left home to become a photographer. I think he went to like 120 countries, so he's a pretty serious photographer. Uh, Only to return to his hometown in 2000 to discover that only 0.5% of forest remained. Salgado founded the Instituto Terra in 1998, and him and his wife planted over 2 million seeds of nearly 300 species of trees and plants. In 20 years' time, he went back, there was 1,500 acres of rainforest which had been recovered, nearly 300 species of plant, 15 reptile species, 172 bird species, 15 amphibian species, and 33 mammal species which returned to the area. It says, so don't let anyone tell you one person can't change the world. This is the point. So listening to that, you're like, I can't really tell. Is that a big deal? So Google Sebastio Salgado Forest. Sebastio, S-E-B-A-S-T-I-A-O. Sebastio, T-I-A-O, Salgado, S-A-L-G-A-D-O, Forest. And there's a side-by-side comparison of what this individual and his wife achieved. It's absolutely remarkable. And maybe a good reason not to depart from Mars just yet. Now, I was going to say I'm going to exactly. do exactly this, but on Mars. <laughs> Claim my Have you, guys, are you guys seeing the side by side? We call it Blakeland. Have you guys seen the pictures? Yeah, I'm looking at them right now. It's remarkable. Yeah, this looks wild. Let's run a podcast. It's not that impressive. This guy really achieved something. Anyway, thank you, uh, Sebastio. It's an inspiration, my friend. That's all we've got time for for today's episode. Thank you to everyone who joined me. Thank you to Rahul. He won the game of the week. Thanks, guys. Thank you to Blake. Thanks. Thank you to Susie. Thanks. And thank you to Victoria. She edits the show. Thanks to everyone listening. To ask us questions or just say hi, you can email us at podcast at We'll see you guys on Monday for the Behind the Numbers Daily, an e-marketer podcast made possible by VTEX. Have good weekends. Have a good weekend. <laughs> Am I not supposed to say uh, something? Last time you, you no, called you can. me you on an Irish goodbye that. situation. I know. Making up for it. I was <laughs> I was a bit nervous you weren't going to say anything. Susie? I, uh, oh, she's gone. She's... Bye. Bye.